human life is incredibly important. What's interesting is the scientific submergence of medical and anatomical breakthroughs, how they're particularly important for a group of people, and what this means in the eyes of philosophy and society through the trade-off between certain ethical implications and outcomes. The article Human Embryonic Stem Cells for Brain Repair, published in 2007 on the US National Library of Medicine National Institutes of Health by the on-screen authors, gives this video a basis, a basis to scientifically break down the systematic procedure through which human embryos are extracted and used as a source of stem cells for brain diseases by detailing research facts and nuanced concepts. Additionally, this documentary explores the social contexts, economic implications, and ethical dilemmas present on several outlooks in this philosophically enriching and contemporary debate. Before Kevin excellently explains the science behind stem cells, I want to give you a simple definition. A stem cell is essentially a cell found in embryos or bone marrow that has the unique ability to turn into specialized cells like blood cells or neural cells, and what this means is they may be used to replace cells and tissues that have been damaged or lost due to disease, in our case brain disease. So, what even is a stem cell? Well, there are two main types, embryonic and somatic. Embryonic stem cells, as the name suggests, come from human embryos. Human embryos are the result of meiotic division after fertilization, as seen on screen. Fertilization is essentially meiosis, a concept covered in our genetics unit earlier in the year. Somatic stem cells come from a specific tissue that's part of the human body. For example, if it's taken from a bone tissue, it will become a bone stem cell. Now, there are many types of brain diseases, though many are incurable. However, stem cells may be the key to future treatments. Human embryos are primarily obtained through IVF, that's to say fertilization outside of the womb. Excess embryos created during the process can be used for stem cell research, as mentioned in the primary article. As human embryos develop, they duplicate their cells as shown in image M. This is done via genomic activation, wherein an embryo activates its own genes, which provides it with energy for cell division and blastocyst formation. This mechanism relies on code from DNA, a topic covered in our science unit. Now, the embryo contains multiple cells, of which a few are stem cells, and this is called a blastocyst. These cells are extracted, and in the process the blastocyst is destroyed. The extracted stem cells are then placed in a petri dish, filled with a nutrient-rich fluid, so that they can continue to duplicate. But how exactly do stem cells help brain disease? Well, stem cells are pluripotent meaning they can change into almost any type of cell, such as the ones on screen. But before being used in treatment, they must be turned into specialized cells first. This is based on which inner part of a blastocyst the stem cells are derived. A blastocyst's inner layer has three parts, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm, as highlighted in the introduction of the article. If a stem cell is from the ectoderm, it can differentiate into any cell that contains the exoskeleton. These cells are then separately placed in a petri dish filled with a nutrient-rich fluid to duplicate. Scientists can then alter this fluid to control what the cell develops into. In this specific application, however, we are focusing on the brain. The brain is a large mechanism made up of neurons and glial cells. Stem cells can be developed into neuron stem cells, which can then generate neurons and glial cells. The article and scientific inferences suggest that these neural stem cells created several neurological recoveries, though scientists are currently unsure as to why. For example, Alzheimer's disease, a fatal neurological disorder for which no cure currently exists, potentially could be treated by neural stem cells because they make neurons and glial cells. This is paralleled to a large range of brain diseases. But are there any alternatives for stem cells? The only alternative we know of are somatic stem cells, which come from a specific tissue of the adult body based on the intended use of the stem cell. But if stem cell research continues, one day, if trials are successful for the treatment of untreatable diseases, this would lead to many major breakthroughs. Stem cells as cures for such diseases paves way for more understanding and knowledge in many aspects of science, extending the foundational knowledge we know about genetics from our unit earlier this year. 
According to the President of the Fertility Society of Australia, 1 in 25 Australian babies are born via IVF, and according to the Brain Foundation of Australia, 1 in 6 Australians will be affected by brain disease in their lifetime. These demographics show the commonality of brain disease and indicates the magnitude of potential this has for large proportions of Australians and the world. And so, this goes to show how significant stem cells are and how much they contribute overall to the field of science. So we've conceptually analysed what the science of embryo stem cell conversion for brain repair looks like in this process and on the cellular level. That's to say the nuanced functions like activation and differentiation. Contrastingly, while it's excellent that scientific breakthroughs on the macro level are being achieved, as stated in the article, the ethical implications are just as important as what good can come about from these innovations. This can be analogized to the hydrogen bomb insofar as it created incredible scientific breakthroughs and theoretical expansions in physics, whilst consequently producing massive economic and more significantly ethical repercussions from a social and humanitarian context. Utilitarianism dictates that an action is ethical if it creates the greatest good for the greatest number. When an embryo stem cell is forcibly taken out and its purpose and life form degenerates and dies, this means that you are literally killing human life. Not to mention that this form of transplantation is widely in the research stage and ergo only very few are even used to benefit stakeholders with brain disease. Comparatively, human life is not necessarily defined as a juxtaposition of cells, but rather an organism with memories and tangible relationships. What this means is very few out of those hundred on embryos with stem cells are even used to create actual babies, and therefore the killing of these, especially to serve for the duty to help millions of vulnerable people, can be viewed as less significant and less unethical. Ultimately, utilitarianism comes to a standstill between the killing of embryos versus the alleviation of millions of people, solely because the scale of alleviation is far greater than the practicality of those particular embryos actually becoming infants, most utilitarians would agree that embryos for stem cell research and application is ethical. Deontology strays away from consequentialism, but rather deems actions to be ethical if they abstain from the negligence of one's duty. When you kill embryos for stem cells, you're firstly disregarding the duty to respect the nature of human life, but counterfactually fulfilling the duty to alleviate pain and the lives of vulnerable people. Therefore, this creates an ethical dilemma that comes down to whether the prosperity and in most cases life of a stakeholder with brain disease matters more than the life of an embryo. While such transplantation is indeed neglecting the duty to value the nature of human life, as aforementioned, only so few even transcend into infantile state, and therefore the duty to protect and alleviate pain is far more tangible and ethical outcome, as those people are essentially embryos that have transcended into a more complex state, and therefore they are more important organisms in and of itself. Virtue ethics isn't concerned with outcomes but defines an ethical action as one that emulates virtuous qualities like compassion, kindness, and honesty. Therefore, no matter how consequentially prosperous the outcome is for brain patients, the actual act of killing any form of life or organism is ultimately uncompassionate and merciless, and therefore this scientific mechanism is unethical from the eyes of virtue ethicists. Furthermore, while economic implications are significant, in that prices are expected to be high, this firstly doesn't impact the principles that adjudicate ethicality, but more importantly, consumers are willing to pay so long as there is a dire and requisite demand to live post brain disease. Three questions we still have about the matter are, first, when about will stem cell research lead to actual new disease kills? Second, what causes stem cells to maintain themselves in an undifferentiated state? Third, what are the roles of public and private investments into stem cell research?
In conclusion, while it's up to you to decide what's subjectively ethical, and we see normative ethical frameworks creating ethical dilemmas, it's widely acclaimed in the eyes of science, utilitarians, and deontologists that the outcomes the world reaches and the duties the world fulfills by the scientific extraction of stem cells from embryos to alleviate brain disorders is principally and scientifically worth it regardless of the ramifications, because the counterfactual to the opposition looks like hundreds of millions of subjectively more important life benefiting in an indescribable and humanitarian way.